The longer you stay away, the better you get. <laughs> That's don't make that a habit, though, you know. It's good to see you. Good to see all the rest of Beth. You you have some of your family members here. All right, good to see you. And the rest of the ones that are visiting with us, it's good to see all of you. Um, it's time now, so I need you to pray for me and with me. Thank you, Father, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. As the song you just played, said, how can we say thanks? How can we do it? When you've given so much, how can we say thanks? Be with me now. Speak through me. Pray humility now. This is important. All these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And the song, the hymn said, the wonder working power in the blood of Christ. The wonder working power. Um, sometimes, sometimes we kind of wonder, have I experienced that wonder working power? Or do I just talk about it and I sing about it? And I read about it. But have I experienced that wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus. What we're going to look, look at today is human relationships, especially the Christian relationship. In order for the church to flourish and to be all that it should be, Jesus calls for every member to live in a constant state of transformation. Something serious going on. It's more to it than what you think to be a part of the household of God. Enabling us to get along. And I'm using get along because we're familiar with that phrase, getting along. Enabling us to get along with one another as we grow together in Jesus. Now, that's going to literally take a miracle. Let me be clear. It's only because of a miracle that I can get along with you. <laughs> it is the only way. It takes a miracle. What does the song say? It took a miracle to set the stars in place. It takes a miracle. For us to get along with one another and grow together with one another as we grow in the Lord. And, and, and Jesus says I, I, you need to be in a constant state of transformation because this is a serious task. The plan of salvation was not founded by us. It is because of us that the plan of salvation was laid. And I tell you, some of us can be very hard, can be very difficult in our natural state. We, we just hard, hard, hard. So we're going to look at this. In our scripture, and we thank Dave for reading that scripture, Titus 3, Titus 3, we go back. Just for a minute. Titus. Chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Paul is reminding the young pastor, he said, keep, the, keep your saints in mind, keep them in mind of what they used to be. Teach them to show them how they are to interact with the society and with one another. And it says, now, go on to tell them that for we ourselves were sometimes foolish. Now, he's talking to the church. Now, well, the church, I guess you the church, so I'm talk, we're talking to you too. <laughs> for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving different lusts and pleasures, Living in malice and envy. Now, this is the one that's really, really, we're going to focus on this part here. But it's all part of the same thing. Hateful. 
hateful and hating one another. And why were we hating one another? Why would, we be hate, why would people be hateful and hating one another? Because of difference. And we don't know how to deal with difference. We basically have a negative attitude because somebody is different. They might have a different language. They might have a different look. They might have a different whatever. They may come from a different place. But for some reason, we hate one another. We dislike one another. We despise one another because we are different. We find it extremely difficult to get along with somebody who's different. That, that amazes me how what, people get married. They think they're just like them, but they are different. <laughs> they are different. They have different thoughts, different ideas, different views. And I know we can get a testimony of that, but we don't need to right now because that's a given. But we're going to look at something. Then this says, now, you, you, you were like that in verse 4, but after the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, that should have stopped. Amen? The hatefulness and the hating one another should have been put away. When Jesus appears, I could have named it that, when Jesus appears. But you also have a title of, of the sermon. This one is called The Thought of Esau. The Thought of Esau. How many in here have heard have not heard of Esau as they've read about it. Anybody have not heard of Esau? Anybody does not know about Esau? The thought of Esau. And we're gonna say, well, I guess everybody knows the same thing about Esau then. We want to keep in mind here, how many want to be like Esau? Since everybody knows about Esau, how many want to be like Esau? No takers. So his reputation must. <laughs> you know, the Bible tells us expressly, don't be like Esau. And it, but it tells you why you shouldn't be like Esau. We're going to get into that today. And when we get to the end, uh, we'll, we'll ask that question again. And we're going to look at Hebrews 12, 14. We're going to get a spiritual mandate. And it has to do with getting along with one another, growing together with one another, and our relationship with our Savior. Hebrews 12, 14. It takes a miracle for us to get along with each other. And there's a spiritual man that says we must get along with one another. So you got to get along with me. How about that? You got to get along with me. <laughs> you need to be at peace with me. This is what 12, 14, it says, follow peace with how many men? And what? Now here's the mandate. Here's the, the reason for the mandate. Without which no man shall see what? Now we can come in here. We can sing, we can teach, we can greet one another, but if you are not getting along with your brothers and sisters, which goes a lot deeper than what we might think, because getting along, you can say, I get along with you, but you can add a three-letter word, I can get along without you. And that's basically the way it is among God's people. Now, uh, that's the way it is. Basically, we come in, we'll greet one another, we'll, we'll talk nice one another, we won't try to start any trouble. Now, at least that's some of us. Some of us just looking for trouble. You know, they come loaded. They're ready to fight. They're ready to war. They're stuck in the den uh, mentality. But the, the average congregations, people can basically get along without you. Now, you don't have to agree with that, but that is the case. They'll go through the motions, but in deep down inside, 
when it comes to really have to have a real active communication and relationship with other people who are different, we avoid it. As long as I don't have to do anything special, as long as I don't have to give up anything, as long as I don't have to humble myself, we can get along. But if I got to go through any changes, I can get along without you. And God has given us a spiritual mandate. You have to have that real, deep, growing relationship with your brothers and sisters and have a life of holiness. Without that, you will not see me. Think about this for a minute. Going into the presence of God, still hating somebody. Think about that for a minute. Trying to come in the presence of God, still holding grudges, still hating people, never seeking to <laughs> remedy the situation. But you're going to come in God's face and say, oh, praise the almighty God, creator of the heavens and the earth. And you can't even get along with this person over here. You can't even humble yourself to say, hey, forget that. The mighty God who created the heavens and the earth can also set relationships right. And I thought, I want you to keep this thought in mind. It says, then and now. Then and now. We, we get that from uh, the Titus. Before Jesus appeared, the people were hateful and hating one another, disobedient, foolish. He said, but when Jesus appeared, all of that you should see. Then and now. Where are you? Where are you? What does the world seem to want most? War or peace? How about the church? If it is a desire for peace, just what kind of peace do we have in mind? Why does being a peacemaker present such an earth-shaking challenge? In view of the tensions in the present world crisis, to become an instrument of peace seems to be a superhuman task or a total impossibility. But that is just what the followers of Jesus, empowered by grace, have been called to be, peacemakers. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called peacemakers. That's one of your signs. That's one of the sure signs that you show the world that God sent Jesus is that now Jesus abides in your heart. You are now an instrument of what? And there's some hard cases out here, folk. There's some hard cases in the church. Now you know what it is in the world. <laughs> Jesus has called us to be just like him, to be what? Peacemakers. Now, thinking about the church being all that it should be, could there be some blind spots in that process? Could there be some blind spots in that process? I know for sure this church focuses on truth, and the foundation of the church is sure. We are strong in truth, but we're missing something in our relationship with one another. We're strong on truth. Man, we will tell somebody the truth. We are so anxious to tell somebody the truth, but we do not have what it takes to develop relationships. The book of Genesis speaks of the relationship between two fraternal twins, Jacob and Esau, sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Focusing on Esau's loss of his birthright to Jacob, we will remember that that the conflict ensued between the descendant nations. Deception and ill-advised practice within a household seem to lay the foundation for this rift between the brothers. Let's look at Genesis 25. An ill-advised practice by the parents. Now, this, now, 
Take note, people. Take note as we go through this. There's a, there's a broader picture here. Take note, uh, this example of this family, take note of what's going on. Genesis 25, 27 and 28. There's a rift between the two brothers. Deception and an ill-advised practice within a household seem to lay the foundation for this rift between them. I'll read it you here. It says, and the boys grew, and Esau was a what kind of hunter? A skillful hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a what kind of man? Already, they have already been, how, how, how should I say this? Stigmatized. They have already been stigmatized. Oh, he's a, <laughs> what kind of man? He said he's a skillful hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved who? Because he did eat of his venison. But Rebecca loved who? Jacob. Uh, Rebecca loved the plain man. <laughs> and Jacob loved the burly man. <laughs> the wild acting man. You know, the man of adventure. You know, uh, I love him. And he would sit there and he would wait for Esau to come back and bring him some of his hunt. And Esau would tell him some of all the things that he went through as he was hunting and tracking down his uh, game. And he, uh, Jacob was eating it up. Jacob stayed around the house, you know, tending the flock. You know, and he was just a simple person, plain person. And, and uh, the mama liked that, you know. The mom would like that. But, but see, the two boys have been stigmatized already. Parental favoritism. This is the first point. Parental favoritism shows a lack of good judgment on his parents. Now, all of you are parents. All of them got children. It is an ill-advised practice to show favoritism among your children. You might like one more than you like the other, but you better not show it. Because they'll pick up on it, and they will hate you for it. Now, you've got more than one, and if you focus too much on one, and don't do the right thing, they will learn to hate you. So if you're thinking about doing it, if you're doing it right now, you better change quickly. If you don't want to come back on you. It's an ill-advised practice. Scripture shows that the conflict could be a lot deeper than what we see here before the parents even intervened in it. They were destined to be at odds with one another. Look at uh, Genesis 25. Stay in 25. We will mostly be in Genesis 25, 22, and 23. What does it say? And the children did what? Now, you remember we talked about getting along? Here these two brothers were struggling. <laughs> now, we are, and I'm going to tell you straight up, we are, as a church, struggling together. It's a, it's, it's a necessary struggle. It's a necessary struggle that we struggle to, to understand what God is trying to do. But here is, it says, and the children struggled together within her. In other words, they were struggling even where? In the womb. For they were even born. And she said, now this is, this is Rebecca said, and said, and if it be so, why am God thus? You know, it, it, what's going on? What's going on? And she went to inquire of the Lord. I'm going to find out what's happening with these children. How did she know that they were warring? Boy, they must have been. Now, I, I've never been pregnant. <laughs> Believe me, folks, I have never been that way. I don't know what it means for a child to be moving around in your stomach. 
But some people have told me they will kick. <laughs> they will literally kick. And sometimes the mother will because the child is kicking. You got two kicking. Oh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> And, and I don't blame Rebecca. I want to find out what's going on. Why is this, why is this going on? But look at 20. It says, and the Lord said unto her, two nations. Now, now, now put yourself in her position. And, and, she, and she's being contacted and saying, look, there's two nations in your womb. And two manner of people shall he be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the young. Controversy. I mean, before the children even born, the elder going to serve the younger? Oh, man. You see, y'all don't understand what this means. We not, are we grasping the, 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 how in depth it is? It says, now look, human beings got issues. If I'm older, I'm not serving the younger. I'm supposed to have more sense than you. I should be better than you. But here it says, two nations, two different people, the elder's going to serve the younger. you got a problem right off the bat. As custom would have it, Esau was born before Jacob, so the birthright should go to him, and Jacob was purposed to make sure that he got it. Which had to do with, now this birthright was important. It say which had to do with both position and inheritance. The firstborn inherited the leadership of the family and the ju judicial authority of his father. This is important. It's heavy stuff. But you're going to find out that Esau's experience and, and experience of his family is our experience. Where do you find yourself in here? But what is Esau like? He acts impulsively. He lacks self-control, willing to sacrifice long-term benefits for the chance of immediate pleasure. By his actions, he shows that he does not deserve to be the one who continues Abrahamic responsibilities and rewards under God's covenant. This is, this is heavy stuff. If you, if you are a confessed Christian, if you confess to be a follower of Christ, you're under the covenant of God. And you hold a certain position. And you, you have certain authority given to you by God himself. This is, this is real stuff in God's family. He lacks the steady thoughtful qualities which are required, then his brother is a deceiver. How will the birthright be passed on? Who will eventually face it all? Many things influence family relationships, especially Christian. Genesis 26. Genesis 26, verse 34 and 35. Follow me now, just follow me. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Beshemeth, Beshemeth the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Now, look at verse 35. What does it say? Which were a what? Grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Now, here, here is Esau shows further that he's not eligible to do this. He further complicates matters by marrying two wives, both Hittite women, who believe in many different gods. You would call that in the New Testament, being unequally yoked. Uh oh.
And we have people today who wouldn't even think twice. They don't even think twice about doing this. Esau didn't think twice about it. He saw them, he warned them, he got them. Do you think being unequally yoked is important in the plan of salvation? I'm not going to dwell on that. That speaks for itself. And it says, He which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and Rebekah. I mean, you know, you think about it. If, the, if uh, most people now, they say, well, uh, how she look? <laughs> and then that's probably the only requirement. What she look like? <laughs> <laughs> and I could go on, but you can you can think on you can, you can, you can you can go with it. But Esau didn't give a second thought by marrying these women. He didn't have any idea how this would affect his relationship with God and with his parents. He didn't have, he, he, he didn't give, he didn't, no, didn't bother him one bit that would affect his relationship with God. And people are doing it today just as hard as they can get. Oh, I, I found somebody. Oh, I, I just got to have somebody. They say, well, yeah, well, uh, let's go on. Again, we get a sense of what Esau was like. He is a headstrong person who acts impulsively and independently of established authority. He's insensitive to the worry, the sorrow, and the reproach he brought upon his parents. It is said that this action alone will forever rule him out of the whole thing. Because his children, his children could never be brought into the family of God. The children didn't have anything to do with it. It was his decision. It says, by attaching himself to foreign wives meant the det detachment of his children from the Abrahamic line. Now, 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 this is important stuff. It might be way back then, but this, it applies to us today. You talk about Jesus and the line of Jesus that follows. All right? Now, at this point, we're going to ask the question. Thinking about Esau, is he a person who lives according to God and principles? Proverbs 21.3. Now, now, now I, again, I'm stressing, the, this experience of this family, of Esau, their experience is our experience. Amen? The thinking about Esau, is he a person who lives according to godly principles? And you said, no. 21, Proverbs 21, verse 3. Twenty-one verse to do what? Justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Some people are dedicated, have devoted their lives to live according to the godly principles laid out in the Word of God. You have to be what committed to doing that. You have to love that. You have to light in the way of the Lord. And Esau didn't do that. If you think about him, you don't think about a person who lives according to godly principle. Now, think about yourself now. We'll go on. Like Abraham, the one who receives the birthright must be obedient to the divine requirements. In marriage, in his family relations, in public life, he must consult the will of God. Esau's problem? He did had no love for devotion, no inclination to religious things. Esau shows he is no more than an average sinner. He's a what? 
He's no more than an average sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How I many don't want to be like Esau? Mm -hmm. Don't want to be like Esau. What kind of reputation Esau had at this point? <laughs> he don't deserve anything, and nothing is to be expected of him because he don't have anything. He's an average son. Whoa. Getting close to home now. Given to self-indulgence, he desired nothing more than the freedom to do just what he pleased. And some people can't stand that. The thought of Esau prepared to face the worst. Jacob spent 20 years away from home. The thought of Esau and the big payback was on his mind the whole time. Jacob is, Jacob is commanded by God, return home. Go back to your ancestral home. It's decision time now for, for Jacob. Obey God and face Esau or allow the passion of fear to rule and avoid him. Think about this. When you, when you have uh, a relationship is broken, you feel like you've been wronged, and you don't want to face these people. You don't want to face them. The passion of fear rules and you avoid them. It said when Jesus appears, that changes. I told you it takes a miracle for us to get along with one another. It takes a miracle for us to be reconciled to one another. Left up to us, the chances of it happening is zero. Once we feel like we've been wrong, we go into our different corners. And we think about ways to pay back. Come on now. The big payback. Decision time. How would he face it? Knowing the way that he had wronged him and what Esau promised he would do. Jacob, this is just what Jacob had done. Jacob, and he knew it for 20 years, it was all in his mind. Jacob had taken advantage of another person's inherent weakness for his own interest. Does that sound like anybody you know? That would take advantage of your inherent weakness for their own interest? Does it sound like anybody you know? Hmm. We have an adversary. He goes around seeking whom he may devour. He felt the need. He said, man, I don't know how I'm going to deal with Esau. It's been 20 years. How am I going to deal with this assumed, built-up hatred he has for me? Building for 20 years. I'm expecting the worst. Thinking about Jacob, thinking about Esau, he was expecting the worst. It takes a miracle. We're talking about the then and now with Esau. Genesis 27. Genesis 27. Genesis 27, starting with verse 41. Are you there? How did Jacob feel about Esau? I mean, how did Esau feel about Jacob? Listen to this. And Esau hated Jacob. Why? Because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then, what? I'm going to kill it. <laughs> he purposed in his heart. That was his life destiny to what? Kill his brother. 
You've heard of you've heard of being suicidal, right? Suicidal means you would take your own life. <laughs> she said, Jacob, not Esau is also suicidal, he's homicidal, and he's fratricidal. You ever heard of fratricidal? Fratricidal means you kill your own brother or sister. He is suicidal, he's homicidal, and he's fratricidal. That's then. That's then. Killing, this is this, killing your brother or your sister. I'm telling you, folks, this, this is our experience. Don't you think, if you, if you read Galatians 5.15, Paul says, be careful now that you bite one another uh, and devour one another. Be careful you're not consumed by one another. Do you realize that people in the church, brothers and sisters, kill one another? Do you know that some people in the church have made it their life's ambition, their objective to kill one of their brothers and sisters because they've gotten into a rip and they hate one another? And they're just like Esau. They come up with a strategy now how I'm going to pay them back. That was then, though. That's then. Let's look at now. Genesis 33, 4. Genesis 33, 4. How many want to be like Esau? No takers yet. <laughs> 33, 4. Now, at this point, most people have written Esau off. And, you know, most Christians who study the Bible, they say, well, Esau is, he don't appreciate anything, so he's gone. Uh, 33, verse 4. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Oh, boy. How many want to be like Esau? How many want to be like Esau? Still nobody want to be like Esau. <laughs> oh, oh. How many want to be like Esau? Boys, listen to this. Listen to this. Amazing things can happen when the love of God rules in the heart. The love of God covers how many sins? How many want to be like Esau? I hear some folks, they won't raise their hands. Oh, yeah, I'll take it now. <laughs> I'll take it now. Why now? Because he did what? Oh, would you say that loud? I can, I, I, man, I can stop right here. I can stop right here. Let me go a little further. Thank you for that. While Jacob was wrestling with the angel, the angel, another heavenly messenger was sent to Esau. Come on now. Y'all got to be touched in here now. This is, this is amazing. This is a miracle. Esau was set on killing Jacob. That was his whole life thing to do was kill Jacob, pay him back for deceiving him out of his blessing. How many people, how many families are now off toward one another, won't have anything to do with one another because of some issue that happened in the family and most of the time it's about money or attention or property. After the parents die, the siblings start fighting. In the church, man, oh man. It was such a pot. Now, if you weren't touched, 
somebody was. It was such a powerful scene, Esau's rude soldiers were touched. So what in the world going on here? What manner of love is this? They could not understand this great change that had come upon their captain. How many want to be like Esau? You want to be touched, don't you? I hope you want to be touched. Dealing with the unexpected. Esau, this is unexpected. Esau, a living example of divine grace. What about you? Are you an example of divine grace? Are you, are you an example to people? Are people... Man, Jacob was so thrown back by Esau's behavior that he said, man, I got to get some gifts here to help him. And Esau said, I don't need no gifts. Oh, man, I don't need any gifts. You can't buy true love. You can't buy true love. Sometimes... Good happens to us when we least expect it. Sometimes we receive far more good than we deserve. Jacob and Esau, guided by human nature, were destined to be mortal enemies forever. So are you and I, unless Jesus appears in our heart. If folk, it ain't going to work. Sitting up in here, sitting around one another, and don't have any real connection with one another, and, and harboring evil thoughts about one another, hating one another, and still going, you going to enter into the kingdom? Oh, no. No, no. This is real. When you, when you saw, saw, or when you read, or when you heard, or when you believed that Jesus died on the cross, that he shed blood, that was God providing forgiveness for our separation from him. Reconciliation is now possible through Jesus' death and his resurrection. This is serious stuff. Unless Jesus appears in our heart, we will never get along with one another. We will never grow together in Jesus. We'll come here and be courteous to one another. That's about the extent of it. But the fact is, we can get along without one another because we have the Laodicean mentality, which we are rich and we are in need of what? Nothing. I don't need to be reconciled to anybody. I'm good. I'm doing good. I got this. Many still wonder about Esau and his relationship with God. See, you know, uh, it's it just like Samson. They say, well, I, I, we've been in Sabbath school and we were talking about Samson and, and Esau. And they say, well, and, and here's what the concern is. Will Samson be saved? Will Esau be saved? How many want to be like Esau? They still wonder. The question we should ask is, did Esau respond positively to divine mercy during the time of separation? Are you responding to divine mercy? God is not going to leave you to yourself. He's going to come to you with divine mercy. And how you respond to it was based on the decision you make. If there exists broken relationship with God or among us, we know that it is because of sin. Amen? If there be any true recon reconciliation, it happens because of divine grace has given us
the capacity to love as Jesus does. If your capacity to love has not been increased or changed, there won't be any reconciliation. And it has to be like Jesus. Jesus says, uh, love one another as I love you. What a challenge. What a challenge to Christianity. What a challenge to church membership. What a challenge to the household of God. Love one another as I loved you. And that is part of the spiritual mandate. Listen to this. Can I, can I see a show of hands now? How many want to be like Esau? <laughs> Esau showed what the work of divine grace accomplished in his life. Esau showed what divine grace was doing in his life. What are you doing? Forgetting self, he took the initiative toward peace and reconciliation. Reconciliation. The one that was wrong took the first step toward what? Reconciliation. That's powerful. That's powerful. Because you know we're proud people, you know. Say, well, they, they, they hurt me. So when they come to me, I, I'll think about it. No. Esau took the first step toward reconciliation. Asian and peace. He was the one wrong. Now here's the question. How many Esau's are there in the church today? <laughs> ah. How many Esau's are there in the church today? Oh. <laughs> listen, listen to this. How many Esau's are there in the church today still stuck in the den? <laughs> Needing to have their hearts touched by God. We're going to close with this statement. If we're going to call ourselves brothers and sisters, we need to practice looking out for one another. And you know what looking out for one another is? We need to, to, to really help one another. We need to build one another up. We need to learn how to love one another. So that nobody needs to miss out on the favors of God. Nobody wants to miss out on the favors of God. See, the Esau back then, he didn't care anything about the favors of God. But the Esau of the now, he wants that. Father, we thank you for this example that you had written down in your word to let us know that we ought to live in peace with all men and holiness without which nobody, none of us will ever see you. We thank you for this spiritual mandate. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the power of grace, the wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus. How can we say thanks? All these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.